and uh, we want to get going and we have a lot of stuff uh, going on. So today we are welcoming two professors in our midst. So Matthias Bernenzo, who is teaching, who's associate professor at Bucknell University, and Paul Cooney at the Universidad Federal do Pará. Pará. And other, and mostly actually at Universidad Nacional General Sarmiento. Okay. Good. You all got that, right? <laughs> do we need to use the microphone? Yes. We do. Okay. okay. So, all right. And this is organized by the Union. Um, Radical political economy. Uh, so I'll let Francis Boyce, who's also our guest today representing uh, said, the said union, talk to you a little bit about it, about what's the project, what the discussion is going to be about today, and then we'll get going after. Hi. Like uh, uh, our gracious host, Matthew, just said, I'm Francis Boyce. I am with the Union for Radical Political Economics. Oh, it's not working. I think it's, oh, it's just how I hold Nobody's it. Nobody's laughing, though. Um, <laughs> So thank you for being here in the first of what we hope to become a series, which we have lovingly called, starting on the Earthy Road Show, because we don't have a better phrase for it yet. But um, what we're aiming to do is to have our scholars you know, that are associated with our organization go to different universities around the country and, and you know, hold, have these kinds of events where we can meet with undergraduate and graduate students and talk more about politi radical political economy. Um, everyone should have gotten just a quick little note about what our organization is. It's incredibly brief. You can find more information at our website, urpe.org. Um, we're very excited to be here at John Jay, particularly for the first of this series. This is no accident. Um, we are uh, thrilled that the economics department here at John Jay has been doing so well, and we know that they've, they've gone through some tremendous growth, and we're very, very excited to support them, to support the faculty and the department. And we just are incredibly pleased that this is the location for our first one. So having said that, um, we'll get right into it because we don't have a lot of time. If you have any questions um, for me, I will be hanging around afterward. OK, thank you, Francis. Yes, so today, the, the way the talk is going to proceed is that uh, both, both of our guests here are going to present a different but complementary view of the economy starting from, from different uh, theories. So, Matthias will talk to us a, lot, a little bit about um, post-Keynesian economics, so he'll, he'll be taking that perspective, whereas Paul will be taking a Marxian perspective. So, I will be asking them general questions, and we'll hover between the two, both of them giving uh, a take related to the question um, that are based on the theory they're presenting today, so to speak. Right? So, without further ado, um, let's start with a, a broad uh, question about the summarization of what each of these theories is about. So, maybe Paul, you could start to us by summarizing what Marxian theory is about and what it has to offer. Sum a summary, right? <laughs> a, light, a, light, a light option. Um, well, as, as a question for I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back in now. Um, uh, the main, the main essential items that I see is quite relevant in terms of Marxist economics. Um, first and foremost uh, is a dialectical methodology, uh, distinct from many other approaches in the, in the field of economics. Um, clearly, the role of history, the importance of looking at history, historical processes, and in such context, the analysis of class, um, and this. Uh, particularly relevant today given the process of a formation of a trans, transnational capitalist class globally. Um, but um, there's, there's many different issues that can, one can look into, the issues around you know, globalization and so forth, but in a, in a nutshell, uh, I see the, the dialectical analysis as key in terms of a methodology for, for a Marxist approach concentrating on looking at dialectical contradictions such as that between capital and labor. Um, in other words, where you have a unity of opposites, right? And it's a different type of dynamic which comes about through dialectical contradictions that is key for understanding modern day capitalism. I think I'll pass this. We only have an hour, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. So, 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 uh, so first of all, to, to 
make clear we have diametrically opposed sort of views on everything. You know, Paul is uh, an American that went to live in Brazil and Argentina. I was born in Argentina, grew up in Brazil, and came to live in you know, the US, which, you know, uh, and that's why he's a Marxist. And <laughs> so, uh, a little bit too deterministic. So, uh, first of all, let me say uh, that, uh, and, you know, that schools of thought uh, and the paradox radical schools of thought have many points of contact and more than a few two points of separation. And RP is not just uh, post Keynesians and Marxists, so there is a wealth of other uh, radical approaches to the economics that ho hopefully as these talks go on we'll have more of those things, institutionalist, uh, you know, feminism, uh, you know, and, and several others that are uh, you know, leaving out. So uh, I'm a peculiar sort of uh, post Keynesian in the sense that I think uh, that uh, Keynes is central but I also think that classical authors are central. So. Uh, and among the classical authors, I think that Marx is uh, the most important. So, uh, mind you, several Marxists would disagree with this idea of putting Marx together. So, if I had to say in one word what he said, you know, giving you a slightly different perspective, and not, not, not that I disagree, is that, you know, classical political economy gives you a sense of understanding income distribution. So, the class conflict that he referred to is central to understanding social uh, dynamics. And what Keynesianism sort of adds is that a good chunk of the classical authors, not Marx himself, uh, believed in a thing called says law. The idea that the system has a limitation uh, in its capacity to grow, and the capacity to grow is ultimately uh, determined by supply side forces. What Keynesianism, and uh, post Keynesians in particular, tend to believe is that demand, not just in the short run, that's the central issue of Keynes. So when prices are flexible, uh, when you have long-run forces, when you're talking about accumulation of capital in the long run, demand is central. Okay, so what Keynes brings to uh, the um, to the uh, as an innovation to the economics profession that it's radical and a radical departure from uh, the mainstream economics. Mind you, even though Keynes himself remained and had several elements in his theory, because nobody's perfect, so his theories remain and have in his books still ideas that uh, you know are connected to the old neoclassical stories that he was trying to reject. He says in the preface of the book, the hardest, the most difficult thing to do is to get rid of those old ideas, okay? But the point is that the market forces, when left alone, don't lead to full employment, and there is a need for demand to be managed in order to get to full employment. And that would be central for any discussion of, of the crisis. Right, so you talked about each of the theories sort of in themselves, and Matt Matthias has talked a little bit about the link between uh, Marxism or what integrate, but how would you view these theories with respect to sort of what I'll call the broad mainstream? What's what's out there uh, in day in and day out in most newspapers and in most economics departments? How could you differentiate yourself from it, and what does do those theories do better in a sense? Right? Right. Um, one of the first things it's important to recognize that there's a whole range of Marxist views within the Marxist framework, and of course, Marxism, in, in contrast, I don't know if some new developments post-Keynesian, it tends to be a, a range of social sciences as well as the area of ecology, environmental sciences, etc. So a Welt on a world outlook, which I'm sure there's some I've discovered. There's actually a neo-Ricardian anthropologist doing work on. The gift economy of Papua New Guinea, but um, it it's, doesn't tend to be a, a forte uh, of post Keynesian. But and, and similarly, there's a lot of different post Keynesians. You know, so there's those that emphasize Swap and Ricardo, and, and those are more linked to Keynes. In terms of the orthodoxy that dominates the profession, um, yes, there's, there's a lot of differences, although there's more engagement, in my view, of the post Keynesian view with orthodoxy, maybe because uh, they can land positions in academia. Um, in, in, no, well, in the States, at least, it's rare for there to be strong presence of Marxist programs. Um, I work in Latin America where there's a bit more of an open view and much more of a chance to be a Marxist and not be in the closet. Um, and so, but, but no matter what, one of the major issues today is the neo neoliberal orthodoxy, which is not just neoclassical, it's more the 
dominance of laissez-faire mentality in terms of you know advocating free trade, privatization, financial deregulation. Um, so you'll get a mix in terms of even what's in the media, but the media does tend to be clearly dominated by neoliberal orthodoxy, but especially a mainstream view. Um, in this regard, it's always a challenge, especially from a Marxist perspective, such as a friend of mine, current minister in Argentina. He's of a Keynesian Marxist persuasion. But as a minister of economics today in the capitalist economy, he's applying what he knows from his Keynesian background much more than what he can from his Marxist view. If he was in a mixed economy, perhaps, there would be more chances that you could apply something of that nature. So there depends on the context of being able to um, uh, go forward or, or implement uh, certain types of policies or approaches. Uh, so, very briefly, I want to say something regarding the first because I didn't want to say that I connected to. There is, a, you know, Keynes published 30, they published after, it's a long after, 30 volumes of his collected papers. And in those 30 volumes, there is only one quote, positive quote to Marx. And it's about uh, the idea of the capitalist system. So he says that when he comes with this idea of what he calls effective demand, to counter says law, the idea that demand is central that that's important in monetary economies. And he says this idea of monetary economies is essentially the same idea of money, uh, commodity, money prime, so the idea of capitalism in Marx. Uh, so, uh, Srafa, you know, he sort of alluded there, uh, Srafa and the Ricardians, uh, which is the sort of Keynes and I am. Uh, Srafa tried to give Keynes uh, Marx to read, and Marx couldn't, yeah, Keynes couldn't really make heads or tails of what he was reading. So, <laughs> so, so, so that's uh, part of the problems of dialogue, but certainly there are, there are you know, more issues of contact, uh, you know, the, the ones I alluded at, you know, what I just said. Regarding mainstream, let me say something that I think it's important that I, I, I normally tell you, I have a blog called Make It Cajunism, and I think there might be some, some posts on this. Uh, there's also an, an RP blog, which once in a while I, I also post stuff, and. Uh, but certainly in my blog, there might be something on, on this particular view of what I think the mainstream and what has happened with the mainstream and why you guys get, actually you guys don't get if you're here at this school, you're lucky enough to have a broad pluralistic perspective. But in most schools, why they get a very conventional view. And the reason is the following. Uh, so uh, the previous crisis that hit capitalism violently, you know, the 30s, uh, led to some revision of thinking. And Keynesianism ca comes at that point. Marxism, on the other hand, comes at a point in which uh, you know, economics is uh, sort of lost. It's vulgar economics. Ricardian economics is not dominant. And you have vulgar economics in the sense that you have just a discourse trying to defend the status quo, pro-market. And Marx basically gets ignored. Uh, there is no significant reaction to Marx other than in the Austrian school within the mainstream. Uh, Keynesianism, on the other hand, is at the center of the profession. And it hits square in the middle. And it says something that it's radical. Not as I told you, Keynes himself wasn't a radical. Okay? Uh, but it says something radical. It says that the system, so when you learn in your, you still learn in your micro textbook, if you have any you know, regular micro text, is that <coughs> if markets are left alone with price flexibility, with no interruptions, you, know, you get uh, efficient solutions. He says that doesn't happen. If you have you know, markets alone in the long run with all the flexibilities, I give you everything. You don't get that. You get that the system does not work. And that got incorporated into neoclassical fashion. So the Keynesian sort of uh, discourse may be, not all Keynesians are post-Keynesians or some variation of Keynesianism that is uh, radical. So most Keynesians, dominant Keynesians, some that are sometimes progressive, people like Paul Krugman or uh, Joseph Stiglitz uh, that got you know, Nobel Prizes, they're Keynesian in the sense that they are called new Keynesians. Uh, in the sense that they believe in some degree of, uh, of you know, if you have to trickle with the economy a little bit to get to, to full employment, but, you know, there is, there, is, uh, there is ultimately, you know, market forces that do work, even if you have to trickle a little bit. So, Keynesianism comes from this very different sort of uh, relationship. Srafa, in 1960, so this sort of uh, friend of Keynes uh, and colleague of Keynes at Cambridge, comes and says, there is a fundamental logical problem with the way the neoclassical theory works. Forget the problems that they had in practice back in the 30s, the theory is flawed. And what people don't, don't normally perceive is that 
After that discussion in the 60s, the economics profession changed. It used to discuss things that were very similar in scope uh, to the classical authors, to Marx and, and, and Ricardo and Smith and those kinds of new classical authors. They thought that they were talking about long-run equilibrium, that when you have uh, you know, market forces in, you know, in play, you get optimal solutions. That's not what modern neoclassical theory tells you. Modern neoclassical theory, which is the intertemporal you know, general equilibrium models, that uh, thanks God you don't get as undergraduates, but if you go to graduate school, it's the only thing you'll get. It's a different thing. They're basically telling you that in the short run, markets are efficient. In the very short run. They don't even talk about the long run anymore. The long run that old classical authors used to talk is forgotten. So certain aspects of Keynesianism change the profession now. And the profession is way more radical. It's saying things that they, use, they didn't used to say 30 years ago. And in a sense, I refer to this, that's why I cited my blog, I refer to this as the return of vulgar economics. The profession has become vulgarized. It's a shallow defense of market forces, of the functioning of the market. And that goes hand in hand with the rise of neoliberal politics that Paul was talking about. And I'll shut up because I'm probably talking way more than this. <laughs> Just, just a, a, a from mention about the, the dominant neoclassical view. Um, on the one hand, I agree with the last comment by Matthias. Uh, it's there's there's it's a vulgar enough, but I don't yet see uh, a clear improvement in general in the academia. Yes, there are some spaces, but I think even post Keynesians and Swapian and others that are somewhat of a different view. There's a struggle to be accepted in academia, and often you make compromises, some individuals more so than others, that limits where science can go. Because in my view, neoclassical economics is much more based on ideology, not science. But if you're taught that from day one, that's what you're going to learn and repeat, and like anything, whether you're in engineering, whether you're in chemistry, whether you're in whatever field. But for me, the, the field of economics today is the field that is so much more based upon ideology, not upon science. That's given the exceptions of the post Keynesian and the alternative schools. But it, it's, it's powerful because it dominates. But it's not a coincidence. Because if you look at it from a Marxist perspective, you're calling into question the dominant ruling economic system. If you allow to consider the idea of class as actually being the basis of how this system works, that's toxic. You don't want to go there. Yes, okay, so very interesting. Let me push a little further in that direction, in a sense, and perhaps give it uh, a body through an, an actual example. But if you listen to what somebody like Paul Fruman has to say about the recent financial crisis, for example, and the, you know, screaming at the, the height of his lungs through his New York Times, well, it makes it seem as if there's actually Dissent, but <laughs> and that there's really choices and that are taken and these things. Um, whereas the picture you present is slightly is much more homogeneous. In the same way as uh, somebody like Piketty, for example, just comes out with a book that has capital written on it and bold letters. You know, so of course it evokes the previous, the, the previous one by the man. But then there's really not much about that book that has to, that has to do with that. So I wonder if, to some extent. Um, there's a recuperation of some of the names of some of the symbols at a moment of crisis without proposing much change to the status quo. It's a little bit the, the, the stalling you, you've been talking about. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that uh, in the context of the current crisis. And perhaps um, in saying that, what would you know, post and propose that's different from what the Paul Krugman or Stiglitz would, would say? And same thing with the, with the Marxist thing. Uh, fair enough. Uh, so, uh, complicated question to what, many layers. So, first of all, uh, there is dissent within mainstream. That's fair enough. Uh, so, there are, you know, Paul Krugman famously has this uh, worth reading column on or post on the dark ages of macroeconomics. Uh, he refers to basically, you know, what he calls uh, the salt water uh, versus. Uh, water sort of schools of thought. So you have the Harvard MIT types, uh, Berkeley types that are New Keynesians, and you have the Chicago, uh, you know, sort of types that tend to be 
new classical, terrible name again, because it confuses the old classical with neoclassical at any rate. So, and, and that's a fairly reasonable sort of a, a way of distinguishing macroeconomics schools of thought. At the end of the day, the differences are essentially and limited to one notion that the new Keynesian suggests that prices are sluggish. So, yes, markets would work perfectly and all would be nice and would not. Provided you know markets uh, did this not just in the short run, but you know, uh, so not just in the long run, but also in the short run. So the new Keynesians would suggest that there is some limitation, some sort of thing. In That's essentially what I said. It's not Keynes' point, and Keynes is very clear about that. Even though he was, as I said, and he remained in his book, you know, in his writings, a lot of neoclassical ideas remain. He was very clear that that's not what he's saying. He's saying. That in the long run, when prices are flexible, with everything is you know uh, associated to the old classical idea of long-term you know equilibrium, you know uniform rates of profits, whatever you want to call it, you know that you still have unemployment. Okay, so that markets do not work in that uh, sort of long-term. So that's a huge difference with Paul Krugman. Paul Krugman has been saying that if you look at the traditional conventional model, it does a good work of explaining the crisis. I think somewhat contradictory to other things he said. So that's part of you know what being a you know, there, there is a thing uh, that I, again, called in, in, this was in a paper, but it's in the blog, if you go, I'm, I'm plugging the blog a lot. So it's called um, uh, Organized Hypocrisy. So there is a thing that, you know, it's, it's part of several organizations, you know. Uh, it's the thing that you learn when you become a father, that, you know, at some point you say, oh, you know, why should I have to do this? Because I said so, you know. And then you scratch yourself, oh, crap. You know, uh, and you know, so there are things that you know, norms, rules that you know, force you and in, into having some type of behavior. So Krugman is forced to say that the theory here says the markets are perfect and it's only some sort of imperfection, and otherwise it would work normally and would not. And then he goes and tells the story that it's not completely coherent with this idea. And so he would say things that are reasonable, that you know, uh, no, that stagnation of wages, which a good chunk of that he has robbed from post keynesian authors, I should say. So he reads other blogs and. Other papers, and so that's a good way of getting good ideas. So, uh, so wages have been stagnant. Uh, stagnant wages have allowed, basically, for uh, uh, in order to maintain levels of consumption of uh, significant bubbles. If you look at our last two sort of expansions, the bubbles were central to the expansion of uh, of uh, demand. Uh, lots of quote unquote again, broadly speaking, Keynesian authors, uh, Win Godley. We have Pierre Gennaro that used to work with the Gwyn, uh, saw that some of these processes of accumulation of private debt were unsustainable. Going back, and I'm talking 20 years, um, you know, people that saw Dean Baker, also broadly speaking, the Keynesian officer, saw the bubble in the housing market. So all of those things were seen, you know, way before the crisis happened. That doesn't tell you when the crisis will happen. It gives you tools to understand what are the, you know, uh, limitations of how the system works. So I would suggest that post Keynesian sort of stories were much better at viewing the proximity of the crisis. Again, when I say post Keynesian, you know, in my view, because I, I would include several of the classical sort of components, so I think that, uh, again, several of these authors have a reading and understanding of Marx and of other, you know, heterodox traditions. Um, I mean, one of the main problems for neoclassicals that deal with crisis is. They don't have any fear of crisis. They, it's not in their vocabulary. It's, you know, it's the system is just supposed to operate, go smoothly, uh, and there, these, there's a crisis. It's something completely external. One of one clear advantage for, from Marx's view, crisis is inseparable from how the system reproduces itself. Crises are not avoidable. They can be reduced, postponed, shifted, maybe to third world less so in one sector or another, but crises are inherent to capitalism. That's a clear distinction of Marx's approach. But you have very quality post keynesians like Hanominsky, his analysis of financial crises is fundamental for looking at the current crisis. You know, how, how did the Federal Reserve come to do what they did? But he was, he was so to speak, predicting it. He, was, you know, he passed away. Um, and wasn't able to do an excellent analysis, I'm sure he would have done at this time. But he did, over, over the years, analyze why, even though we put into place things like Glass-Steagall to prevent, you know, the, the domination of investment banks with um, people's mortgages and a number of different regulations put into place, were then eliminated 
unfortunately under Clinton during the 90s, and then it's not, it's a surprise that we have a crisis in 2000. Um, just curious, just to know what terms I might use. Who here has read some part of Marx's Capital? Oh, this is a different school. <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's not an expected response, at least you used to know she's when I left the States 10 years ago. Good. Uh, good to hear. Because um, one, one of the things I think is that uh, the Marxist view has an advantage in, in analyzing the crisis, first and foremost, there's a range of different views about crisis uh, within the Marxist world. Um, you, have, you, know, you have the theories of underconsumption as associated, well, you have your conservatives such as Malthus, but you have underconsumption theory Rosa Luxemburg, great revolutionary, but you've got the theory associated with, say, Month Review School, John Bentley Foster currently, Baron and Sweezy in the past. Um, that's one of the key theories of crisis. You have the wage squeeze theory. Um, not as relevant for understanding this current crisis, but was very key in the discussion debates in the 1970s, often associated with the structure of social accumulation today. And then you have the different debates over the falling rate of profit. Um, just showing that wonderful graph. Uh, one of the many possible, although there's, it's one of the more common ones. And in contrast to what Matias said, for me so far, there have been four major crises being capitalism, that we call a general crisis. The first was the Great Depression of 1873 to 1893. It wasn't as heavy as what then became called the Great Depression. I guess economists had some problem with their memory. It wasn't the second Great Depression. We were just calling it the same name. And that was 1929 to 1941. But then there was the crisis that was a depression. And that was the accumulation crisis in the late 60s, early 70s. And why was it a depression? Because thanks to the New Deal and Roosevelt's policies, we ended up putting in place welfare programs, limitations of where finance could go, and prevented what was a very serious crisis for capitalism, of not being a depression in most places. Now, of course, when happens a crisis, it's a very different story in many parts of the third world. It's something that we really need to understand because uh, if we talk about a system being successful, it can't just be successful in G7 countries. It has to be something that can be successful across the globe. Africa, Latin America, and countries of Asia included. And lastly, well, here we are in the next crisis, and we don't know when it will end, in my view. The acute first phase did come to an end. But, in my view, we are still in a crisis. Just look at Europe. Just look at the predictions by the IMF for GDP. And that was now uh, dubbed by Krugman the Great Recession. Just a note on Krugman. Krugman at times says some great things. But Krugman, he's still an advocate of free trade. No one in the third world can take that seriously. And it reflects a bit of a, excuse me, Yankee arrogance. That's not about the baseball team. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's an attitude you can stake and make and stand in U.S. academia, but it's not something that you can really talk about in seriousness with people who suffer from free trade policies in the rest of the world. Great. So let me ask you one last question. And I want to say, uh, we'll leave some time for the crowd to interact, ask questions, queries, and everything. So. Prepare yourself, in about 10 minutes will be your turn. Last question. But there's one last thing I would like you to talk about a little bit. Um, if you go fast, you won't return. I can follow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me make it short. What's the end game? So, in terms of the organization of the system, there's crises all the time and these things. But what's, what's the sort of long run vision that each theory has to offer with respect to the economy, to the economic system? Uh, so, well, I, I can only give you very personal, so I'm informed by certain sort of views and theories uh, and so I can sort of, with that, give you a sense of what I think uh, might happen. So, uh, I'm very pessimistic overall, but particularly for uh, the advanced economies. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, I would say I have a different way of, uh, you know, maybe, you know, just refer to the Great Depression, but, you know, crisis before, but you know, I think uh, it's still there. It's in the 70s, there is a significant crisis in capitalism. You know, now it's dubbed by the mainstream the great inflation. You know, it's their way of saying, oh, this inflation is as bad as anyone. Now it is. Uh, but that's another story. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's a revolt of the elites and the 
alludes to changing capitalism and whatnot, and you know, several of the structures that we have in place these days are sitting in this backlash against Keynesianism from the 70s. You know, the, the sort of uh, Keynesianism, broadly speaking, the sort of what in the US would be the new deal policies, in Europe would be the welfare state policies, and whatnot. And we're still in that. So you see that uh, we have had uh, a president that passed uh, legislation, which is essentially a Republican legislation, uh, you know, private sector. Uh, health coverage uh, for most people, uh, you have this incredible sort of rollback, you know, for obvious other reasons too, but you know, uh, so, and this is the first expansion of the welfare state since Nixon, in the case of the US, so, uh, which is amazing if you think about it, uh, and it's a very limited sort of expansion of the, of the welfare system. So, uh, there's no space, it seems, in the US. Uh, because Democrats, the so-called progressives, are not going to you know, pursue Keynesian policies. In fact, if you look at the data, who has reduced deficits and reduced spending consistently, going back to Gerald Ford, uh, it's the Democrats. So when you get a Republican, they expand spending and expand you know, deficits because they cut taxes. But the point is, they do it differently than the old New Deal uh, progressives. So they cut taxes for the wealthy, and they spend mostly in defense. Uh, so it's a change in what the state actually does uh, increasingly. And there doesn't seem to be any prospects of any change soon of this. So Obama has actually conducted a significant you know, uh, contraction of uh, deficits and of spending after the you know, initial increase in 2009. So, so the federal government has been partially contracting. There are transfers to states and stuff, so once we look, but it has been partially contracting. And so I don't see many prospects in the US. I don't see many prospects in Europe, in all fairness. So in Europe, you have a stronghold of very conservative, anti-Keynesian ideas, austerity, austerity, austerity. The IMF that supposedly change and it's more Keynesian you know, says, oh, yes, you can sort of have a little bit of fiscal expansion, but you know, pretty soon you have to retract. And in all fairness, when you look at their programs in Greece and, you know, and other peripheral countries in Europe, they're all contractionist, with no exception. Uh, so, in the century, it seems that you know the, the space for uh, for uh, progressive policies it's incredibly limited. Uh, I'm somewhat hopeful uh, about the you know developing world, uh, in the sense that uh, China is still growing, even if less than before. So it's not 10, 11 percent, but it's still you know uh, seven, seven and a half. You know. Uh, that implies that they will, although the prices of commodities are falling, uh, they still demand in commodities in, you know, in really large amounts. So depending on what commodity is, you know, it's the largest share in the world. So iron for Brazil, it's huge. We'll give you an example. Uh, so there might be, and, and South-South trade, the trade done by, so alluded here to the notion of free trade and whatnot. South-South trade, the trade between developing countries, which used to be a fraction, you know, very small amount of total trade. So developing nations tended to trade more with the developed world than among themselves, and the vast majority of trade in the world was more than 50% was between developed nations. So it was Europe, uh, US, and Japan mostly were trading. The rest were considered. Now it's more or less the same size of, uh, of uh, South-South trade as North-North trade, about one third of, of global trade. Uh, so the rest is North-South. So that implies that there is more of a chance because there is a sort of another machine generating demand in the world economy uh, in, in Asia, uh, which still has to transfer significant amounts of people from rural areas to, to urban areas, you know, numbers that are absolutely nuts. You know, we're talking 200, 300 million people. Yeah. So it's, uh, which would lead to them to need to build schools, to do all of these things, the infrastructure of, you know, development and urbanization that uh, may keep demand going and may keep part of the South afloat. So uh, I, I see a more hopeful perspective in the South. Um, the, uh, as far as what we're talking about looking forward the next 10, 20 years, is what you're saying. And, you oh, know, no, not necessarily. Oh, we're going and beyond the, that. Okay. Um, till, the, till the king is done. Yeah. Um, right now, in my view, we have a uh, sort of a state of denial or, you know, there's the powers that be in terms of the domination of finance capital. And finance capital is way in excess of what's good for capitalism. That sounds a bit contradictory, but there's plenty of capitalists that have made huge fortunes and have been very successful in terms of their profitability. 
But in terms of the overall system, we've put way too much investment in the area of finance, and finance does not generate any new surplus or surplus value. It may generate profits, but that does not generate the, the basis of the system to grow. I can't go into discussion of fictitious capital productive and unproductive labor would be appropriate, uh, but given the time limits. Um, however, this is for me one of the key things to understand, and it's there's an issue of children playing with fire. They play with fire, they got burned in 2008, but they burned their fingers. They're playing with fire again. I mean, they haven't learned, they don't need to learn. They're, you don't have a stigmatic improvement, which would be a preference to who uh, runs the economy in place in the United States. As Matthias correctly pointed to, those in Europe, they have not learned the lessons of Keynes in the Second Great Depression. They continue to pursue austerity. Um, unfortunately, I feel in order for a change to take place, they need to be burned right up to their shoulder. Or is there going to be another crisis necessary? I'd rather see it not happen. I'd rather see Obama and the powers that be recognize that what they're pursuing is not good for capital. But there's no capitalist overseer for the system. They don't know what unproductive labor is in general. So they think they're going forward. But if you take a look at profitability for many, uh, many companies, it's been high, but accumulation, rates of growth have been low historically compared with the early period, especially in places like Latin America. Referring to the third world, yes, China's grown, but I don't, I don't see China's third world somewhere in between. The population is still a third world population, but China is a first world economy. Um, but the thing is that at one point China depends on the functioning of the US economy in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the virtuous cycle of debt to US consumers at one point can become a vicious cycle. We don't know when that could break. But at some point those uh, rates of seven and a half, at some point they're actually gonna go negative. China is not immune to recessions from capitalism. It will happen when that happens then there's more concern for countries like Brazil and Argentina that are totally dependent on selling to China. Not just those countries, you know, all of Africa. In which case, if such a crisis takes place, in my view, there might be the possibility of strengthening regional trading blocks, such as Mercosur. If Brazil would look inward and try to strengthen something within South America, not something that would happen overnight, you'd have a more chance of succeeding. Why? These countries can't compete in international markets with their manufacturing goods. It's not like the 19th century. If the World Trade Organization was operational in the 19th century, neither Germany or the US would be able to compete against England. It, the, the, what exists today with the World Trade Organization, and productivity differentials are much greater than in the past, they don't have a chance of competing against South Korea, China. Brazil can compete against Colombia, Venezuela, or Argentina. So if you have an internal trade block, there's a chance for hope, and I would advocate some type of uh, Keynesian policies mixed with a push for a uh, non-capitalist sector such as cooperative. But this may sound like a pipe dream, but the alternative may be worse. <laughs> just briefly say something. Uh, so uh, just, I gotta do this. I don't think it's based on theory, let's say, but, uh, so Paul is too optimistic. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so you know, first of all, I, I would qualify. I yes. would qualify sort of thing. So I, I don't think necessarily that you know, Brazil, Argentina, uh, send should export to China. So there is more diversity. In, uh, there, there is a question that those two countries and most of the developed countries, that most advanced economies, let's put it relatively within Latin America. Uh, that industrialize, they export manufacturing goods only for the region. So they're still, for the rest of the world, exporters of commodities. So that sort of problem remains there. Uh, but in terms of income per capita, we're talking of, uh, of countries that uh, have probably double income per capita in China. And that goes why I think he's so too optimistic. So the notion that China is sort of the couplet and it's an advanced economy, I think it's uh, far off. So China, China is now getting, for example, in the last uh, plan, sort of, you know, annual plan or whatever it's you know that they have uh, to build airports and airplanes and whatnot. But when you look at the airplane that China's building, uh, essentially, you know, uh, they're building the framework of the airplane. That's what countries that you know, produce airplanes do. It's who builds the engine of those things. And there are three companies. It's uh, two American companies and one British company. 
uh, who builds the uh, electronics through companies, uh, and they're American. Uh, so they'll put in their planes, including the military planes, GPS technology, which was, surprise, surprise, not done for you to get lost when you come to the you know, room at a university. It was built to know where you are and bomb the crap out of you. And so they'll have in their military technology, technology that it's American. So the notion that, you know, and that goes with other things, so the notion that the dollar is at the yen or the US and yen. So even with this economy that it's really terrible for the advanced economies, I see a little prospect of a rise. So when I said, you know, that the South may grow, and certainly it's not immune to crisis, uh, said that, you know, at least it seems that uh, the sort of slide in which income per capita increases a little bit and rates of poverty go down and, you know, some social policies that allow for the alleviation of the worst of, you know, poverty and inequality would certainly happen with some lack of central government in Latin America are possible. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't think anytime soon that these economies will become developed. Just a footnote. Think of one economy after the ones he cited, Germany and the U.S. Uh, and, and Japan that actually became developed. South Korea, probably, if you... If you and, yeah, and South Korea, so here's my joke. Now, I always say this in Argentina. So South Korea, okay, fair enough. Add North Korea. What happens with income per capita? So if that's what you want for a development project, I always say, so let's go to Argentina, we'll say the following thing. We move half of the population, or one third of the population, south. We put a border and we give them the bomb. Okay, and then we say to the U.S., oh, can you open markets for us? <laughs> you know, so we have North Argentina and South Argentina. And, you know, and that's a development project. That's the only one since the ones he signed. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Rich. Are there bleak vision? Um, any <coughs> questions from the crew? All right, all the way over there. He's infiltrated. He's from the new school. All right, that's okay. It's okay. Um, but just speak up, though. Marxism has definitely established in Mercosur, you already know that. So, would you say, is it working down there in Mercosur? Brazil has grown a lot. Most of the population is having access to internet, education, 
For Argentina, with Cristina, it's not yeah. clearly the same picture. The peso is evaluated. You know, I'm always making friends with my Argentina jokes, and they told me that if I go to Buenos Aires and I have a hundred dollars, I can buy, I can buy the crap of Buenos Aires. Now, Dilma got reelected. She has uh, well, Dilma got reelected in Brazil. Yes, yes, yes. She has good numbers in the general sense, but I think there is this kind of new field that many economies in other sectors are not trying to explore is inequality. Brazil inequality since the time of Lula, and now with Dilma, I mean. In general terms, the Gini coefficient has moved two or three points in the last seven years. Even though that everybody's talking about Brasilia, how great it is, or the great job that Dilma is doing. For Uruguay, we got Jose Mujica. I don't know much about the economy of Uruguay, but you know, he's really famous. He's this president that he's driving a 1970 car. He lives, he's, he, and he doesn't like bodyguards. He just dresses with sandals. So I'll say, with all these Marxists combined in South America, did it work in some places? How did it work? How can it still work in? And what are the arguments that right governments like Chile or Paraguay are doing? For example, Paraguay are in big trouble when they have this, you know, impeachment of the president who was very close to Cristina and to Dilma because he was on the left party. Not really, you know, not basically a communist or a Marxist, but really from a left and also Chile, which centrals its bank and its government on a right, on a very right wing. So, will be the ultimate global. Like Dilma has this kind of leadership of America because Brazil is so much greater than the other countries. And like, can the Brazilian left wing government try to help or initiate this Marxist movement that could spread to other parts of the world, maybe Central America, maybe, maybe Europe? Okay. Thank you very much. So let's take okay. a okay. Last one, or first question um, was it regarding the uh, issue of wages and class struggle and issue of the growth cycle. And one of the important things we have to look at or recognize is that one main aspect of neoliberalism is it's been about class warfare. Class struggle hasn't disappeared. It's just that the most active class in terms of class struggle has been the capitalist class. And they've not just been active in digital countries. In, in my view, following the view of William Robinson and Leslie Sclair, sociologists, I feel we are in the process of the formation of a transnational capitalist class. They know what they're doing, and they're achieving it. It takes the form mostly through transnational corporations, and the transnational corporation could pop up in Brazil and Argentina, but at the end of the day, who are they serving? Right? And this, this also reflects um, what to go about that, there's got to be a class struggle at a global level. The outsourcing, the, 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 the Walmartization of the economy, there's, there's going to be no alternative except some level of global organizing. Not a simple task. It's going to be a matter of decades. If you look at what took place at the end of the 19th century, well, it took a number of decades before we had the eight-hour day here in New York City and across the globe. Um, but to me, that's a key thing. Real wages, for instance, uh, in the U.S. has been stagnant since 76, a slight decline. Um, other countries, you've had huge declines in wages, such as in Argentina. Um, I currently suffer from that actually. Personal choice, I was in Brazil. Um, so I think that uh, the issue of uh, workers and trying to fight back against the new policies is an is absolute first step. And it's not been so simple or straightforward as we would think. Um, referring to Mercosul and, and the South, for instance, Brazil, it still has a chunk of neoliberal policies functioning. It's made movement. It's not left wing. It's left of center. Lula never was socialist, never claimed to be. But it's left to center. They've improved the situation for your average worker, but not a lot. Not the way you'd expect a partido de trabajadores to do. But at the same time, wages haven't gone down as they did with Cardoso. Um, same with Dilma. I mean, as as a professor, she did us she did us in. She she cut in she cut the possibilities of better salaries for newcoming professors. Argentina is a real complex situation, but um, in terms of Argentina, you've had much better growth 
especially the beginning of the 2000s, than Brazil. Brazil is one of the myths of about how much growth they've had. There's a year or two, they hit 7.5, but they've often hitting two, three. They've been below the average of the world. They've been below the average of Latin America. But you ask anybody across the globe, oh, Brazil is booming. And it's not booming. But that's so not your fault. Um, it's complicated. And so some of these governments have tried to do the right thing, but there's the right wing and they're organized and the media plays a big role. On the other hand, it doesn't help in my view when the pro-government media also does its lies. Like Pafina Dose in Argentina. You know, there's it's very difficult. I have to go by in the right and left. Uh, yes. Well, it was left of center. Anyway, no, it's it's yeah, it's center left. Center left. So they're left enough. Okay, fine. All right. Agreed. Um, the other question, Ruthie. Um, yeah, Keynesian policies clearly is not the only solution to overcome the crisis. The nature of this crisis. Um, I mean, it's, it's a crisis of accumulation at, at the basic level. The cause of this crisis, in general for me, has much to do with the problems of, well, I have to shift it, uh, the problems of profitability from the 70s and a lack of a significant recovery. There was recovery in the early 80s with the shift towards neoliberalism. If you look at U.S. inequality, it was as of 75 with the push by uh, Friedman, the Montpellier Group, and others were able to achieve a huge recuperation in terms of income. Um, and so at some level, there was an issue of capital wanting to reestablish better conditions, and the wealthiest increased their share of wealth. Um, so, But the crisis at some level was, uh, instead of leading to a new, serious, high-growth new phase of accumulation, We've had increased uh, role of finance, and in my view, this has led to lower possibilities of accumulation. In other words, they're not exploiting workers enough um, in terms of capital. Um, uh, very briefly, so uh, I think there is a lot of discussion of. No, I guess. I'll build coffee. Not, yes. <laughs> so wages. So I think there is a lot of discussion of I think of uh, and, and exactly an area of uh, I've been a lot of developments. The, the issue of wage led versus profit led. Uh, I have done some research on that. I have some problems with the so-called Kolecskian models, which I don't think are Kolecskian at any rate. Uh, so there is a discussion of whether what has so the notion was at some point that profit the advanced economies at least were profit led. So that uh, the sort of stagnation of wages was good for accumulation of capital and growth. And there has been, I think, significant discussion uh, now showing that it wasn't, that they were profit-led per se. So these are wage-led economies that, in the absence of raising wages, were able to grow on the basis less than before. That's important. So they're not doing well, but still grow on the basis of debt. So they became, instead of profit-led, really debt-led economies. And that goes to some extent to Ruthie's question of uh, what the steps of we got into the crisis, which I briefly said, you know, I think part of the story is wage stagnation, why class matters? Wage stagnation was substitution, so it's substitution of debt for per wages, and that was central, so income distribution was central for the crisis. Uh, regarding uh, Brazil, very briefly, oops. So here you have, when you look at Brazil and, 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 and advanced economies, and you know, it looks, you know, Brazil is growing more or less like the world, uh, particularly in 2003, 2014, that's the Workers' Party. And so it looks, oh yeah, now they're going through the world and much better than, than advanced economies. So, oops, then compared to emerging economies. Data from the IMF, it's, you know. It's, so when you see that, Brazil outperforms, you know, it's terrible uh, in the first part and actually really out, you know, it performs better than the advanced economies, but much worse than the emerging economies. Argentina grew almost double in the same period than, than Brazil uh, in this last uh, decade or so. So there is a, a significant there uh, gap in, in Latin America. The other thing is you know, China, and goes to uh, Ruthie's question of, you know, before going to the whole thing, but uh, I put to, more, more to Paul's sort of comments on, you know, Ch China, you know, his reply to Ruthie. Uh, Ch China's economy is, uh, Basically, the, you know, when he talks about a, an elite, that it's global, you know. I mean, the Mexican elite is global, has been global for a long time. You know, ask where the ex-presidents of Mexico are. 
don't work in here. They, you know, seldom stay in Mexico. You know, they have a. I have. I once heard this guy that was. You know, he told me he talked with the finance minister in El Salvador, and he told him that oh, he doesn't. You know, El Salvador is where his family has the farm and they go visit, so to speak. You know, his money is all inside, so they don't keep it there. So in that sense, you know, it's obviously they have been globalized uh, for a long time. Uh, they're globalizing the economy. So there are a few groups that dominate the global economy. The first Chinese group appears there. I say there. You know, appears at some point in the you know 50 something. You know, in the top 20, you have only groups that are you know from developed countries. Uh, so developed economies, corporations own Chinese corporations. Chinese corporations don't own developed uh, corporations in the world. To Ruthie, you know, the question of just Keynesian, you know, Keynesian policies. Uh, oh, good Lord, you know, it's not just. You know, it's it's so relevant. You know, it's not like unemployment is. You know, it's a uh, it's central, so we can get even there. And that's the story, you know. There is this sort of rift, that is, you know, what allowed all of these policies that, as Paul said before, allowed for the 1970s not to divulge into a huge crisis of unemployment, is that it wasn't just Keynesian. Keynesianism didn't win on the, you know, Keynes said that it's only ideas that govern the world. He was naive in that, and he knew better because he was, you know, doing politics all the time. So what central is? You know, the struggles of workers. You know, you don't have the new deal without workers, you know, sitting, you know, in factory floors and demanding for, you know, legislation that transformed the American economy, you know, the Wagner Act, the, the right to organize. So it was all of the in Europe you don't have Cajun policies within without the rise of uh, of the social democracy and socialist governments in a good chunk of uh, of uh, or at least coalitions, you know. Uh, with socialist governments in several parts of uh, Western Europe. So it was a hard-fought fight. And what we have had over the last 30 years is a retraction of those things. So it's, you know, it's not that fiscal packages come alone. They come with protection for work. They come with protection for you know, uh, you know, certain uh, rights of workers to class that they, they, they tend to protect. So Keynesianism could be understood in this much broader sort of sense in which includes lots of radical and progressive sort of notions. So, so I, I, I take Umbra, it's not just Keynesian policies, it's, you know, it's, it's Keynesian policies in that broad sense that allows us to get out of this sort of funk. Uh, I don't think we're, you know, so as I said, I'm very pessimistic, I don't think we're even close to this. Alright, thank you. Actually, there's a class coming in and we have you know, five, six minutes. I'd say Let's wrap this up, but these two great speakers are not disappearing, so if you want to keep discussing, maybe we can brought the thing forward, but otherwise, let's thank them all yeah. for the great uh, <laughs> And thank you for attending and coming in. Oh, and again, if you're interested in the Union for Radical Public Economy, there's some little uh, pieces of paper here that you can grab from the uh, <laughs>